Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. It's so great to be here with you. In fact, you are joining us in Napa Valley. I know uh, myself and Priyanka and Marcus and Michael are all, uh, all are all right here in this beautiful place. And um, so super excited to be with you, uh, Paula. That was a incredible introduction and thank you very much for that but you missed something you didn't say that i am an eager and uh and anxious uh host to our trade friends so i want every one of you to make sure i'm going to put my email in the chat and the second you get uh safe to to travel and come see us in napa valley you look me up because i know you have lots and lots of places you can go with people you know but uh, we love to take care of our trade buds so don't be shy uh, we would love to see you as soon as you can get here um but uh and also i'm a proud local since 2004 and i am the mother of a 2005 and 2007 vintage napa valley kid so um so very, very proud to be part of this community for sure. And super excited to introduce um, all of our, our panelists and, and, and these wines to you. I'm actually going to be uh, tossing questions and comments uh, their way, even when we're not talking about their individual wines, because all of these, uh, we really, really have a star chamber of, uh, of talent on the panelist team here today. And so, and they all have a, a, a breadth of experience uh, with the terroirs that are here. And so um, we'll be, it'll be a really fun to, uh, to get their perspectives just in general about the wines and the soil types and so on. What I want you to do, because we're gonna jump into a very quick slide deck that just gives us a grounding and a basis for where we are and what we're talking about, Napa Valley, and then in particular, its association, of course, with Great Cabernet Sauvignon. It's the jewel in our crown, as you know. Um, but uh, while we're doing that, I'm really hopeful that everybody has your glasses poured so that you can uh, begin to nose them and also feel free. Yes, we're going to jump into this, the details on the wines together, but go ahead and nose the wine so that you can kind of benchmark where they are. You're already going to see huge diversity in the expression just on the nose. You can also go ahead and get them on the palate if you want to and know that you can go back. Uh, but I want you to be doing that and starting to um, get a little bit of a, of a reference point for the wines because they're going to evolve in the glass over time as well. And we're going to be talking a lot about how to taste these and how to describe them and how to think about them. So let's jump into our slide deck. Um, and this will be a quick one. But like I said, pick up uh, any one of the wines and start um, smelling them, obviously, in, in tasting order if you can. And I think I think we know we've given the order, but it's Raymond, then Pine Ridge, Stag's Leap, then St. Supri, then Signorello, and finally, Catherine Hall. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll repeat that for sure, and, and you'll be able to jump in with us. So, uh, but um, the first slide that you saw, the very introductory slide, that's our response to um, you know, like every wine region in the world, we got a labor shortage, and so I've been seeing a whole lot of hardworking sheep out there doing some mowing uh, this spring season. Um, that's a little tongue in cheek, but uh, yes, that, that's indeed um, how how we're getting the job done at least part way around here, and of course it's. Uh, it's beautiful to watch. Um, so let's move to the next slide. And of course, everyone knows, you know, Napa Valley, it's got this huge footprint, but we're very, very young and we're a very, very tiny fine wine region. So really grapes have been growing here um, in Napa for just under 200 years. Um, and that's really, really small in, uh, in vineyard years, for sure. When you think about places like Burgundy that have been planted since before the thousands, um, we only represent 4% of California plantings. And so there's this enormous identity, but we're tiny when it comes to actual tonnage of grapes harvested. Uh, one sixth the size of Bordeaux, which arguably either that or Mendoza are two of the largest fine wine regions in the world. Um, and only 9% of the county is planted. Um, so it's a tiny percentage of the Napa Valley that actually is devoted to vineyard acreage. And we're 55% Cabernet Sauvignon. The next grape down, I think at about 14% is Chardonnay. So clearly we found our strong suit and, uh, and the rest of the world is, is definitely drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so only 4% of plantings, but 27% of the sales value of the wines from California are represented by Napa Valley wine. Um, 
And additionally, um, we were the second AVA or American Viticultural Area named after Augusta in Missouri. There are 16 sub AVAs today and we'll be going over those in a bit. We're also, and I'm super proud of this, it's not something that people necessarily understand, but it's so important. The first agricultural preserve designated in 1968, people like Don Chapelet and Jack and Jamie Davies and some of our other pioneering vintners worked hard to, uh, to get it um, established legally that Napa Valley is an agricultural preserve. And so it will always be an agricultural preserve. It won't be developed into strip malls or gated communities and it will look like it does today for the most part. Um, and that's an important thing for, for uh, open space, for, uh, for car carbon fixing and for, um, and for keeping this place really devoted to uh, its highest and best use. This is my personal opinion, um, of course. And uh, also pretty special about us is that they're all, the wineries are mostly boutiques, very small, 80% under 10,000 cases and 95% of them family owned. Uh, what that does of course, is it gives you this incredible commitment, right? And that's really, really a big deal for us. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, now, of course, um, we've talked before about how small it is, just 30 miles long, about five miles wide at the widest point. So you can think about it in terms of scale, kind of like Manhattan, uh, but a lot of special attributes very enormous soil diversity over half of the world's soil or orders 30 different soil series which basically speaks to the origin of how the soil was formed but then a hundred different variations within that and so it really is like a crazy quilt of uh, of soils that makes it a fun playground and an exciting painter's palette for cabernet vintners because not only do they have the five bordeaux varietals to play with depending upon where and what the soil looks Looks like, but they also have very different expressions of Cabernet itself based on soil to which increasingly they're devoting um, very, very uh, detailed thought and work to rootstock selection and clonal selection that even further really optimizes each plot. And so that's a big deal. We also have, which is a huge, hugely big deal, a Mediterranean climate. And what that means is um, most of the uh, precipitation takes place in the winter time, very little rain during the growing season. So you don't have risks of disease pressure and, and fungal pressure the way a lot of other classic wine regions in the world do. Um, there are very few areas that have the Mediterranean climate. Of course, there are those specific actual Mediterranean adjacent uh, regions, but there are very few others, a few places in Israel, a few places, uh, significant parts of the Cape region of South Africa. So we're very fortunate because what that does is it contributes a, a wonderful, long, long ripening season because we don't have to worry about uh, unseasonable or harvest season rains coming and messing, messing with the quality and dilution, uh, causing dilution or rot um, at the at harvest time. But it also gives us this huge diurnal shift, meaning the difference between the lowest temperature overnight and the highest temperature during the day in the growing season. So if we can go to the next slide, it'll kind of drill down on this a little bit more. And that's actually uh, my vineyard. But what I took that picture because what you can see um, is that it is you see that layer of fog this is early morning um, sun just risen so you see that layer of fog still sitting over the top of the vines on the valley floor and you can also get a sense for that where there are hillside plantings there are aspects of and certain parts of vineyards that are above the fog line and below it and that has a big difference in their overall um, access to sunshine hours during the growing season and so when we get that diurnal shift we're really, really lucky. That's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, of course. Sorry, we're still back in the dark ages of Fahrenheit here. Um, but uh, you get that intense, beautiful uh, uh, sunshine during the day that gives you the photosynthesis and therefore the grape ripeness, both in terms of sugar, but also in terms of the rest of the grapes components that contribute to its structure and complexity. And then of course you get that cooling at night that gives the vines a rest. Just like us, you know, we like to have things cool down at night so we can sleep. The vines take that time that reduces their transpiration. It, gets, it gives them time to regenerate, slows down the sugar accumulation, and it supports acid retention so that we get balance. We get structure um, of, that keeps, that balances our ripeness. And so if we'll go to the next slide. Um, 
And of course, we talked about there being 16 total AVAs. And you can see I've got the this uh, simplified Napa map here because I like you to be able to read it really well. But each of the AVAs is listed out. You see our valley kind of running uh, northwest, southeast, essentially. And um, it's really bounded on both sides by a mountain range, the Vaca Range to the east, the Mayakamas Range to the west. And then as we get to the very southern extremes of Napa Valley, where we have the Los Carneros district, which straddles both Napa and Sonoma, we've got proximity directly to the ocean in the form of being very close right there to the San Pablo Bay. There's also the Petaluma Gap, which brings significant cool Pacific Ocean air in. So we've got those two uh, sources of cooling ocean air. And if anybody's ever been to the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California, you got to get all the way to Hawaii before it's swimmable. That's me. Um, but of course, your wetsuit and your surfboard, you're good to go. But the point being, it's so cold that those cold, the, that that cold air, especially when you consider the heat inversion, which actually as the heat of the day cools down, um, the cool air just basically gets sucked up from the south of the valley all the way through to the north. So your coolest region that loses the fog latest and gets it earliest, those regions are in the south. So Los Carneros and uh, the Oak Knoll District, for example, are generally gonna be cooler. So if we advance to the next slide, as a general rule, we get warmer as you go north. So it's counterintuitive, but again, that's because of the ocean influence. So that's a really big deal for us in that diurnal shift. That's what also contributes to the diversity because we can have cooler climate expressions of Cabernet, warmer climate expressions of Cabernet, and we can also have the complementary Bordeaux varietals that will give us an additional tools to play with, right, in terms of gaining complexity in the wine. So let's go to the next one. And um, now when we're tasting, because we're really going to try to drill down on this, we have six great wines and we really want to uh, to get at them, to get at their identities and their diversity. We're going to be kind of looking at, at two key factors or two um, two sides of the coin of tasting. And the first of those is their style. And I'll get to quality in a second, but starting with style, it's kind of like that's a potato potato, right? Is it is it? Uh, red fruit or black fruit? Um, is it is it dark earth or is it um, you know like iron oxide you know uh, metal metallic smelling earth or things like that? We'll have wood factors, and then of course, in addition to scent and flavor, there are structure factors, right? So those are all things that are attributes in the wine, and then and you can like them, um, and they can be less or more intense. All of those things though are attributes that we'll be looking for, and we'll be putting some descriptors to them. Um, and then let's jump into the next slide, because in particular, when it comes to fruit, when, when you're thinking about reds and, and um, particularly Cabernet Sauvignon, I like to think pe for people to think about the fruit in terms of a spectrum from lean to lush and ripe, right? Generally not gonna be a lot of lean fruit in Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, but as you're going towards the leaner end of the spectrum, you're into your red fruits because your red fruits are usually a little bit less ripe. They're a little bit more tart and a little bit more subtle, right? So you're thinking your red currants, cranberries, pomegranates, red cherries that generally get, land you in Pinot Noir land, right? So then if you get into our more juicy and mouthwatering fruits, those are getting into your plums, your softer, sweeter berries, like your raspberries and your strawberries, your riper, darker cherries. Then you can get into your lush and ripe fruits, blue, black, blueberries, blackberries, figs, that type of thing, right? So when we're thinking about fruit, we're gonna be at the at a minimum talking about, is it red, is it black, is it blue? And then what's the condition of it? Is it ripe, is it uh, raisinated? Is it compoted? Uh, <clears throat> all those types of ways of characterizing it. Next slide, we're also, of course, when it comes to Napa Valley Cabernet, going to be talking about oak because we'll, we have, it's one of the great uh, one of the great, you know, I'm going to use the trite phrase, but it's the winemaker's spice rack, but it's really true. It's one of the, the great partners to Cabernet Sauvignon because Cabernet has such structure that it really wears oak beautifully, right? And so uh, mostly we'll be talking about French sourced oak and those types of characteristics, which tend to be the baking spices and the vanillas of the world versus American oak, which often has an expression of more coconut, sometimes dill. Um, I, 
I sometimes say bourbon barrel, which of course bourbon barrels are American oak by law. So that makes, that makes some sense to me. Um, and we know of course that the impact on the wine is dependent on the level of toast, the barrel size with the, the uh, Bordeaux Barrique 225 liters being standard around Napa, but people are playing with different things here for sure. And then whether the oak is new or used because once you've used it, it gives less impact. Usually the first year, I think you get uh, the studies say like a 25% reduction in the oaky characteristics that we're describing here. And so age of the barrel matters. And then of course, length of time in the barrel matters. Um, and sometimes people think longer in the barrel makes it more oaky. Sometimes that's actually not the case. So maybe some of our winemakers will be able to pipe in on that. Let's jump to our next slide now, because now we've talked about the style factors that we're gonna be looking for, fruit, earth, wood, and other. And then the structure elements, body, we're looking for power here. We're expecting it, sweetness, not sugar sweetness typically. In these wines, I'm not seeing sugar sweetness that's uh, notable. Some Napa cabs have a little bit of more sugar in them, but we're definitely getting sweetness in the form of ripe fruit, right? So that gives a sweetness perception, uh, which we want, right? We don't want to taste fruit that tastes underripe. Um, and then of course, acidity, that's a big deal for us. We, we have, we're so fortunate to have great acid structure in our well-made wines. And then of course, our tins, I always like to, for people to think about not only degree of tannin, what's the level and we've got six wines here so we can really compare them a little bit although the tannin will build up on our palates by the time we get towards the end but we're also talking about uh the the texture i really like people to think of it in terms of texture and in particular when it comes to napa valley cabernet there's always a plushness there may be a thick napped plushness like velvet or, or chenille or it may be a, a much finer softer I, I would say less nap or less thickness like a suede right and everything in between so i want you to be thinking about those things, about texture. And then of course we've got quality factors, right? So there's potato, potato, but then it's, are, are the potatoes rocking, delicious, amazing, or just so-so? Like my mother's potatoes from a box. Did you ever have anybody, anybody have any potato buds from a box? Yeah, okay. That was the old days. She's changed her ways. Um, but anyway, so um, balance, we're looking of course for balance of all the components as well as the winemaking impact, right? Balance with oak and things like that. Length, how long does the finish last? Anything that's good quality that's fermented has a finish, whether that's chocolate or coffee or tea. And so if the finish is longer, it's a sign of quality. Intensity, right? Is it, uh, and we're expecting a lot of intensity from these wines, but there's some elegance here too. So we'll be putting it onto almost a spectrum. Um, complexity, what are the layers? What's the detail? Uh, it's so important that we taste our Cabernet Sauvignon out of a good glass that preserves that detail. And so I just really want to emphasize that you have to have a glass that gives you a nose so that you can really uh, get the detail because let's remember when you're tasting, flavor comes from smell. So your tongue gives you sweet, sour, bitter, salt, umami, temperature, and texture. All of those are important. But where you get flavor, comes from your sense of smell. So you have to have a glass that's giving you a smell. And yes, if you're out by the pool and a red solo cup's the only way to go, still drink your wine and still drink your Napa Cab. But when we're tasting it and trying to really showcase it, we need that great glass because we need to get a nose. Um, and then of course, ageability is always considered a sign of quality. And when we say ageability, meaning it's gonna get better with age, right? And sadly, a lot of people think all wines get better with age and it's like, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> only the ones that have the structure and the balance and the length and the intensity and complexity. And then finally, typicity. Is it delivering on the promise of the region? right? And the promise of the specific terroir. So with that in mind, let's jump into the wines. And first of all, I'm looking, uh, yes, Jeremiah, I really did eat potatoes out of a box at one point. And I'm going to check the Q&A here real quick. Um, Claude Lalonde, God, great question. What percent is organic in Napa Valley? It is going rapid, it's growing rapidly. And um, uh, maybe, I'm not sure if Connor, if you have that statistic, um, but if you do, that would be great for you to pop that into the chat for us. Um, and I will say though about organic that um, it is certainly one standard of and one valuable approach to or potentially valuable approach to um, the most sustainable farming. But 
in general, Napa Valley looks at sustainability on a much broader uh, footprint than, than merely um, avoiding avoidance of chemical inputs and, um, and, and the related regulations that are inorganic um, in the organic certification requirement. And I think that's really important for people to think about. And that's part of what's so valuable about such a high percentage of our wineries being family owned. It's often the case as well that they live amongst their vines or live a significant portion of the year amongst their vines. And when the dogs and the kids in the little league field um, are right across from a historic vineyard, um, basically you take care of the whole picture. And that includes uh, water use, it includes carbon, um, carbon neutrality or, or carbon fixation and, and min minimal use of fossil fuels and other inputs to greenhouse gases. It really focuses on the people involved and their health, safety, and well-being, and it focuses on the community, right? And this is a really tight community, really, really proud of how well we take care of each other. So, um, so we that's a great question, and hopefully we'll get um, an answer to that. And then, Claude, if I did left uh, Stag's Leap AVA off of my map, that would be my fault, nobody else's, because that was my map. So if I did that, thanks for the catch. And I'm so sorry to my Stag's Leapers in advance, uh, but we'll point out where it is when we get there. So let's jump into our Raymond wine. But first of all, um, if, you're, if you have, um, oh good, Jeremy's booking his flight right now. Uh, if you have uh, had a chance to nose the wines, I would love to uh, have people to start popping into the chat with, um, you know, is this red fruit or black fruit? Let's just start there. And uh, this is Raymond Vineyard's reserve selection. And those of you, I think most everybody has the wine. You see that um, it's got the velvet label. So that, that might be a stop you wanna make on your next visit here to see the velvet room at Raymond Vineyards. But this is a family owned winery that that has, um, has gone into um, sort of a next iteration in the sense that it was started by the Raymond family who lived uh, our longtime Napa Valley uh, locals. And uh, I remember uh, serving Raymond wines on the wine list at Windows on the World back in the late 1980s. And so, and I don't, I think they're celebrating maybe 40 years in business now, um, but um, their, their uh, core estate uh, wine estate vineyards are in the St. Helena and Rutherford Appalachians. So right mid valley. Um, a huge percentage of their acreage is valley floor as opposed to on the bench lands. Um, and so you get uh, deeper, more fertile soils there. So they get a lot of, uh, a lot of richness and um, a lot of their farming is, is devoted to controlling the vine vigor so that the vine doesn't overproduce because they wanna get that beautiful concentration of fruit. Now, when I smell this wine, I'm immediately um, struck by the sort of mix of red and black fruit because I get red cherry on the nose, but then a really sort of dark cassis type of quality. And I'm drawing the distinction between cassis and blackberry because cassis is like a uh, black currant syrup. Blackberry is always a little bit more earthy and a little bit more wild to me. This one is very, has a very refined and polished and lush um, ripeness to it. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a try if you haven't already. Jeremy says it's black fruit. Agreed. Um, and I'm almost, I'm thinking almost here, um, there's like black plums, but almost kind of compoted. Uh, tannin structure here is very, very, uh, I'll say velvety. And I know Jean-Charles Boisset, who um, purchased the Raymond Winery from the Raymond family, would like that descriptor. Um, and that's what really they're going for, is this polished, luscious, um, voluptuous type of quality here. So this wine, um, the 95, I think, is what a lot of you are tasting. 92% Cabernet Sauvignon with a little bit, 2% each, of Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Cab Franc. And then 1% Merlot and 1% Petite Syrah, which is interesting. Um, and people might think, you know, 1%, that's crazy. But I have to say that I have been with winemakers who were finalizing their blends, their Cabernet blends, and they would get, and I've tasted one where the difference between the two was 0.5% of Petit Verdot. And the difference between the two was 
dramatic. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know exactly how that works. And I can't wait until I'm not the only one talking. Unfortunately, I've got to do the first two wines because our guest winemakers um, start with number three. But, um, but maybe uh, since, since we have uh, Michael Scholz from um, St. Super here, and you are quite familiar with kind of this neighborhood, um, can you talk for a second about uh, when it's sort of this Mid-Valley, St. Helena, Appalachian, Rutherford Appalachian or AVA fruit, um, what is it about that Mid-Valley loamy soil that kind of, uh, that marks its, or that, that how, how does it impact the vines and the style? And or can, we, can we assume that this plushness is coming from, uh, a, or is related to that sourcing? I'm putting you on the spot there, Michael. Oh, you got to unmute, and that's this is important to us because we all want to hear your Thanks. Brooklyn accent. Just yeah, kidding. right. <laughs> Thanks, Aria. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Yes, I can be put on the spot. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, look in in Mid Valley here. What you're doing is you're moving a little further north off of the cool areas of South Valley. So as you move into that those areas, while we get very structured wines, we also get an elegance of of um, of, of texture and of completion in the wines. And you'll see that right through, certainly through Rutherford, which is a very powerful structured wine, mm -hmm. yet with an air of elegance. As you go a little further north towards the, uh, the St. Helena, um, similar sort of situation, but a little more ripeness and aromatics and what have you as you go, go in that direction. You know, we do have those loamy soils, um, depending on the location, a lot of gravels running through those soils, which help enhance structure and texture and what have you. But generally, I mean, um, while they're serious red wines, they, always, they also, in this district, come with a sort of an air of elegance uh, in their completion and what have you. So yeah, that's sort of a bit of an idea of what I think we see here. Mm. Beautiful, and and let me ask you this because one of the things that that the um, they talk about with this wine and the wine making, and this is I, I I was blown away when I saw this, but maybe I shouldn't be. It says um, for this particular vintage, the wine spent between twenty one and fifty nine days on skins. Then it was aged for twenty months in a hundred percent French oak, what about one third new. So I'm, what my question is for you is about the time on skins. It seems like on the one hand, getting into 59 days on skin seems like this really long maceration. But I have also read that, that you get to a point within maceration where you're actually not adding more and more and more tannin to the wine and something's happening and it's changing. And some people use longer macerations to get softer wines. Can you tell us what the science is there or why that would work that way? Because this is so soft and integrated. Yeah, the, the simple approach towards this, the, this chemistry and that is the polymerization of, of tannins. And so if you give those uh, wines greater time, you give those wines greater opportunity to increase their polymerization, which generally means a softer feel to the wine. Um, so, I mean, we, uh, we all... I guess most of us are using um, extended maceration on our wines to some degree. Uh, um, you know, seven days past fermentation is considered an extended maceration, but it's in the eyes of the of the of the winemaker, I guess, as what their um, ideal situation is. And generally, what will be happening is we'll be tasting these wines on skins and making decisions. Um, so. If you give it a short extended maceration, you will enhance that softening um, textural approach. If you give it a more extended long-term maceration, you will do that more, but with, with that often you'll start to dr um, drop a little bit of the density in the wine. But there's a balance and a marriage of what you choose as a winemaker and your vision of what you want to achieve. In the case of this, when you say between 20 and 59 days, um, I would assume that what happens is some lots have been done in that sh shorter maceration period. We're maintaining the colour and the structure to be more intense, but some have been done in that long, long extreme to get more softness, and then uh, allows that the wine maker to have that opportunity to to cre create that harmonious balance between the two, which is kind of cool. That is very cool. And Nathan um, mentions Nathan Hooper's mentioning that he had no idea longer maceration can actually contribute or can contribute to polymerization. And um, and it is one of those things that's counterintuitive. So I'm glad we talked about it. Um, where do you land or do for you personally, and we'll get to St. Supery, but just with Cabernet for at St. Supery, are you all over the place? Do you adjust it wildly every year for the vintage conditions or do you kind of have a system that works for your fruit? 
No, um, we, we're, we're within a sort of a shorter window than, than uh, we've just described at St. Supery. Um, I've done a lot of trials on, on this extended maceration over the years. And in fact, there was one year I actually put a wine on extended maceration for over three months, in fact, almost four months. Just, just and the purpose of that goal is a lot of years ago was just to understand what does happen the longer you leave it. And you know, making notes on on uh, seven days in, fourteen days in, twenty one, and so forth. And that's what we realised is that if we believe that it's maceration to be quite extended, as long as you look after the condition of your wine, which is important, of course, as you go, um, you will just end up having a softer and softer wine. You'll also drop. There's a point where wine will start to drop its colour a little, and um, and that's fine because what you get in exchange is that softer feel, which is great. So for what I've found for us is that we don't want, we're not looking for that extremely long extension. We do like an extended maceration, but some of our wines might be extended only for seven days. And each wine has a bit of its own personality. So you need to be a little aware of your location, of your vineyards. And even for me, our blocks within our vineyard um, and what we want to do. But we're the more we're doing past fermentation, uh, we're doing maceration about seven days, sometimes 14, not often more than 21. Um, so in a shorter window, generally. Yeah. Very cool. And so, and I'd like everybody, we'll talk, we're going to talk a lot about extraction as we're going through, especially with, with the where the wines where we have the winemakers on the panel, because that's that's a big deal. But like if you if I don't know if you can see this, but if you're like rolling the, the glass around and seeing the 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 density of color as it's uh, extracted and sort of sticking to and staying the sides of the glass. And then the last thing I wanna say about this wine is make sure you leave a little bit, as I'm coming back to it and back to it, it's now got, it's now starting, just now starting to show, show some floral and even some like sweet pipe tobacco and or sweet <laughs> chewing tobacco, like my grandfather and my father used to carry around in their pockets, um, big red or whatever that was, but, um, if you opened those those foil pouches, there was this really heady, sweet smell. And I'm just starting to get that on this wine. So it's it's really opening up. Um, we're gonna jump to the next wine, but I wanna ask, I'm gonna do a quick poll, but with Marcus and Priyanka. Priyanka, I'll start with you. I just wanna ask you, um, uh, what are your ranges of time on skins for Cabernet Sauvignon? Um, and did you ever do a longer experiment and uh, you know throw caution to the wind and scare yourself the way uh the way michael did no i know you weren't scared. uh but what what's your what's your range well uh, thank you andrea you know i um agree with michael in the sense that we tend to stick with shorter extraction periods i think you know when you're going for the longer macerations your initial extraction protocols during that active fermentation also tend to be modified but we found with the signorello property um, we have pretty low vigor in general, and that results in really concentrated berries. And we found that the longer we left it on skins, eventually we started to get a little bit of those seed tannins uh, seep through the wine. So it was leading to a little bit of bitterness and astringency, not really the direction we wanted to go in. And so there is a difference in terms of the different blocks, I think, even between the clones of Cabernet that we have on the property that does tend to, you know, take us down the direction of how do we want to do it. You know, clone six in particular is a pretty well-structured clone. And so those tend to be the shortest maceration periods, whereas clone seven that we have at the back, um, I'm really pushing to get a little bit more out of those wines. And so we'll extend those to, you know, anywhere between, um, I would say 16 to 21 days, but usually uh, 21 is the maximum that we've gone um, for Signorello Estate Fruit. That's a great, a great thing that you pointed out. We'll talk um, some more about that as we're talking more about winemaking when we get to uh, the Signorella wines. Um, but I'm glad you made the point about the seed tannins because what I hadn't realized until I was reading more about it recently is that it's, it's the seed coat breaking down is really in the presence of alcohol. And so until once you're once you're fully fermented, that that time on skins post fermentation, and yes, we're talking about it being post fermentation. Nupur uh, Gogia was asking. Um, then you do have you've got the alcohol, and so you have to be watching that. And so I guess that it would be why winemakers also go through and know going into the vat what the seed condition is. That's right. You like when you're testing and tasting to um, decide harvest and all that. You're crunching that seed because you want to know if it's going into the vat, what condition it is, right? 
Absolutely. Looking at the color of the seed, you know, for me, even when we're doing maturity sampling, we're always breaking the berry open to see how many seeds, you know, whether they're green, they're starting to turn, you know, lignify and starting to turn a little brown. That changes your idea of, you know, the direction the wine's going to go in. And even the, the skin, if it's a thicker skin or a thinner skin, that gives you a lot of direction, what the skin breakdown kind of feels like as you're tasting through the field. And most importantly in tanks, so during fermentation, I find, especially at that most active point in fermentation, that it's so important to keep checking back on tanks to see the direction that the wine is going. And then you can modify, you can choose to either really push for extraction mid fermentation or pull back depending on how the wine is going. But the end goal has to be very clear, I guess, of the kind of wine you're making. Um, and for me, when you're going for structured wines, I like to have you know, a little bit more of um, structure to lead us down for ageability purposes. And so we tend to definitely go with maybe more structured tannins that will take longer to really mellow out and bottle, but it guarantees us a much better ageability of our wines as well. Right. Oh, that very very cool, um, Marcus. What's your what's your range for um, for uh, post maceration um, cuvées on or time on the skins, and then we'll jump to the next wine. Yeah, you bet. I mean, it, it definitely depends on the season and the growing conditions and what I'm seeing. I mean, in general, it probably ranged from being on skins for between two and a little over three weeks, but certainly depends on the vintage. Um, you know, I do see an advantage of being able to leave the wine on the skins uh, for a longer period of time. I think you could get some interesting complexity, uh, especially as the fermentation kind of gets closer and closer to dryness. But you have to be careful <laughs> uh, because, again, and, and in, with our style as well, you know, I like the wines that have a lot of complexity. I like them to be rich, but I don't want them to be too over the top or have a real bitter sensation and all the what you guys have been talking about with seeds is really the key, especially late in the fermentation. And if I'm going to go long, the seeds got to be right. Um, otherwise, you're going to have, especially in the presence of alcohol, the potential to, uh, you know, we want tannin, but we want good tannin. We don't want seed tannin. We don't want right. harsh tannin. And when there have been times when I've gone long, like extended, you know, you know leaving things on the skins for a month, I mean, or more. I don't tend to do it very often, um, but when I have done it, it is in the more, the more uniform years in terms of ripeness. For example, like 2016 was a nice vintage to leave things on the skins. Again, it was a nice uniform ripening season. In other years where, although you know, I saw more variability in the vineyard, let's say, say long lingering duration like 2015, that was a year where I knew there was going to be more of a broader spectrum of ripeness in the fermenter. And that was a vintage that I shied away from doing much uh, extended con skin contact. With our state wines though, I, I do, if, if the conditions are there, I do, you know, it's kind of fun to leave a tank on there for a while um, to see what kind of interesting complexity you get. And it may, may be an interesting blending component later on. Um, but in general, you know, it's usually between two and a little bit over three weeks again, kind of depending on, on the vintage. Fantastic. Um, and I'm going to pick on you for one more quick second here. Um, Nippur is asking, um, how does extended maceration affect MLF, malolactic? Does it start mallow while in maceration? Is there a pat answer to that or <laughs> what, what's it the deal? It can, in the bad distance where some of the risks, <laughs> you know, where there's risks, sometimes there's rewards, right? But one of the things that can happen in an extended skin maceration is if you have a lot of whole berries, uh, those berries tend to, the fermentation can go dry, right? And then they can release more sugar back in. And that's now you're providing more food for some things that you might not want to have happen. Um, they can go through ML on you. And as long as the wine is dry, I mean, this is just me talking, as long as the wine is dry and it goes through ML on skins, you're good. Um, but the risk is if it winds up not being dry and then you go through a melt, then you have a bit of a, uh, a bit of a nightmare. When, when we, um, again, when we do it, one key is I try to keep the tank really topped. Um, so even if it's not all the way to the top, I'll put, add some wine to it to keep that tank all the way top. And then we try to keep that cap fresh 
blanket it with CO2 if there's any airspace, and then uh, try to freshen it up like two, three times a week. I'll come in and just kind of splash the wine over the top. But before you do an extended skin maceration, I try to get out as many whole potential whole berries as possible to avoid that. So uh, right. come off the bottom valve, that's where the whole berries settle out to try to get the tank set up uh, to do that without having uh, issues. Wow, that's really cool. And I hadn't thought of that, but that's it, it, it would be, that would be a scary point where, cause you could be feeding M mal or uh, lactobacillus or you could be feeding, you know, you know, whatever, VA bacteria and all, all man manner of things that uh, you wouldn't want to be feeding um, with a few extra burst berries in the bottom of the tank. So that makes sense. Um, so we've got uh, a couple of other questions, but I'm going to uh, feed those in as we jump to this next wine. And, and I'm actually going to pick on you still, Marcus, and I'm going to come to Priyanka as well, because we're in a sub AVA here with the Stag's Leap uh, District um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Appalachian Cabernet Sauvignon from Pine Ridge. And um, man, I, I wish you had the wine in front of you. Um, and I'd love for people to pop into the chat anything that they're smelling on this wine. But mercy, is this ever different from what we just smelled? And um, I immediately got straight to more floral and more um, herbal, but in more of the sweet, sappy herb family like Bay Laurel, which we have a lot of around here. And, uh, you know, when, when you can grab one of those leaves and, and, you know, smell it, it's just really expressing in this wine. And I will say that over the years, and I remember when Stag's Leap was, um, was the AVA was approved and they did a, the a wineries like Pine Ridge and Stag's Leap and um, um, several others did a big tasting in New York City where I was working and um, and I was tasting that alongside Anthony Dias Blue, who used to write for Bon Appetit, the wine column. And we both came away with this this idea that Stag's Leap really had this real fragrance to it. Um, and so Bay Laurel, a little bit of sweet tobacco again, even a little bit of like basil and tarragon, like very sweet herb herbaceousness. Um, so I don't know if anybody... Uh, I just, I just even got like a little bit of like Earl Grey tea type piece to it. So Marcus, um, are you with me on these sort of more, uh, like these more, the aromatics I'm describing? Cause it, it jumped out at me in this wine before the fruit, or it was like, it, it was like the lead dog, let's say, um, is that, is that typical for you for Stag's Leap? Well, you know, our two, uh, estate vineyards, uh, the Fay Vineyard, and the FLV Stag's Leap Vineyard, which are uh, interesting enough planted right next to each other, uh, but they have different soil types. Uh, but the Fay Vineyard has a very distinct perfumey uh, floral note, like that bright berry pie, thin cherry, but that little floral note is like its signature um, that really defines it. You know, I think for all wine, you know, wines in the Stag's Leap District, we need to remember that uh, you know, we are in the southern part of the valley. In fact, when uh, Nathan Fay, you know, first planted Cabernet uh, here in the early 60s, there was no Cabernet planted even south of Rutherford at that time. And our area was thought to be too cold uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon. Isn't that funny? I mean, luckily, Mr. Fay planted it. And later on, when you do the, you know, the research, you know, you see that um, um, we do have an extended cooling period here. You know, the fog here lingers till about 9, 9.30 in the morning. And when the sea breezes, the air conditioner kicks on, you know, it hits us, you know, 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but on the other side, you know, we are in this bowl and surrounded by this rock. And so we, we, we're warm. So when the, when the fog does break out, we get quite warm here. Um, that's what brings out the nice ripe flavors in Cabernet Sauvignon. But that nice shift, I think, is what really defines a sense of, like, soft power that you see in Stag's Leap District Cabernets. Um, oh, I love that you said that. Depending on the soil power. or where it's grown, you can get the perfume in the older soil, or you can get more of uh, more darker fruit characteristics in the more younger and volcanic soils too. That is uh, that that's so interesting. We're getting some great comments, um, and, and when you when you put your tasting comments and you guys are doing amazing, please if you can select panelists and attendees because I want everyone to see. So Yvette said. Uh, agree, honey, herbs, aromas, floral, and very unique. I didn't think about the honey, but 100%, and that's 
not a word that comes into the Cabernet lexicon very often, but it's it's amazing. It's like it's really really right right spot on. Um, Bill's talking about uh, orange zest, uh, blood orange zest, which is so cool. I'm also getting now um, a lot of mouth watering acidity. Like this, the acidity on this kind of really zings through the wine the way acidity in like a raspberry does you know like cherry you don't sense the acidity but if you eat a raspberry you almost more often sense the acidity so i'm getting this red fruit raspberry thing you mentioned fruit pie marcus um priyanka i was going to ask you you're not in the stag's leap ava but you're in the zone and i'm just curious if you um if you find these sort of more lifted aromatics in in that kind of neck of the woods Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, I was an intern. One of my first internships in Napa was actually at Stag's Leap Winery. And that's when I got exposed to, you know, just the more Southern end. And I found it was so much more nuanced and not just the fruit spectrum of aromatics, but just more than that. It was right. more floral, more perfume, more herbal even, which are, you know, flavors and aromatics that I gravitate to very naturally. And so I'm uh, really excited now to be here at Signorello and kind of even further south from Stag's Leap. The Stag's Leap Appalachian border falls short just a mile north of us. And then the Oak Knoll Appalachian falls um, just a little bit west of us. So we kind of sit in the broader Napa Valley Appalachian, but between the two sides of our estate vineyards, our estate Vineyards are Western focused, which are the vineyards you see when you're driving down Silverado. But then we have our Eastern vineyards, which kind of sit in that little canyon on the back, which if you were to hike, you would get to Stag's Leap Wine Cellars and Stag's Leap Winery. And so we do see a very different uh, expression of fruit between the two sides. And for me, just to have uh, not just Cabernet Sauvignon, we have some Cabernet Franc on the property and some Malbec in the back. And they just get a little bit more nuanced, more herbal. We have really pretty violets that comes out of some of that fruit in the back. And uh, it's it's very exciting uh, spectrum of fruit to be working with. Very cool. And th th we're getting some other great comments here. And um, I'm just going to say to everybody that when you guys come, that's what we're going to do. We're going to hook up with Priyanka, taste a little wine. We're going to hike over to Stag's Leap, hook up with Marcus, taste <laughs> a little wine. And, uh, and just hope we don't run into any mountain lions and coyotes along the way. <laughs> But uh, um, so Marie Claire Parado is mentioning, and this is really right, right on because it, it's it's a hundred percent new French oak for twenty seven months, and she's saying the amount of oak combined with that bay leaf resin had her jumping to an American oak assumption. I agree, it's just so lifted and 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 bay and sweet and almost coconutty. Um, and then Francois, you, you're Lumuel, cantaloupe on the nose, but. I totally get you. The really ripe one, the Texas cantaloupe, I'm gonna say, um, cut just cut open when it's perfect. Um, and Christopher's saying it feels the wine feels very Mediterranean in its architecture. Yes, because it's got that mouthwatering almost pomegranate type acid, uh, but then it's got almost a gariginess in it in its herbaceousness um, in the best possible sense. And whoever commented that it's holding this 100% new oak for 27 months very well is absolutely right i think it's a, a a real a really beautifully um really beautifully done version of that much uh, of that much oak um we need to jump to move on to the um the stag's leap artemis cabernet sauvignon and um and uh, first of all i just want everybody to to you know uh take a second and I've, I've smelled this several, like four times <laughs> since before I was on screen with all of you and then, then three or four times subsequently. And um, it keeps changing and changing and changing. But when I go back to the glass time and again, I'm getting a, a really uh, a, a savory. I'm also, this is the first one where I'm really getting like earth. I got earthy stuff on the Pine Ridge here. I'm actually getting as if I had been digging in the garden, right? Like some, some, so like some dark black, you know, nice uh, composty earth. And then there's this coffee bean thing going on. I don't know if you guys agree, but it's also super subtle and more into the black fruit family, but that's just on the nose. So Marcus, if you wanna tell us a little bit about, um, I think the first place we should start is the fruit sourcing specifically. Is it like, uh, or, you know, estate vineyards? And then what are you bringing in from other places? 
and um, and kind of what's the uh, what's the sourcing and what's that contributing to the style here? You bet. Well, first of all, I should say when you do that hike from Signorello to Stagsby Wine Cellars, you should definitely look out for the mountain lion. And if you could check all the freaking turkeys out of the vineyard when you get here, that would be very much appreciated. Because you got it. <laughs> when I drive out there right now. So, so we'll we'll do our best. You know, um, would be scare, much appreciated. Scare away the turkeys game there. Good. Yes, and the descendants from the stag that left, that got away from the hunters, uh, hit them, them also because they have an affinity for Cabernet Sauvignon, particularly uh, as it gets ripe. So it's been uh, Artemis. <laughs> listen, Artemis is uh, she's the goddess of the hunt, uh, protector of the stag. It definitely represents what this wine is meant to be. It's meant to be a hunt around Napa Valley. You know, um, as you showed in your earlier slides. You know, it's just such a small place, but it's got such incredible diversity. Um, making wine here is so much fun. There's nothing better than a day when I have a starting down in Carneros, looking at vineyards down there, and it's cold, and you got to have a heavy jacket. It's windy, and then the end of the day, you're up in Calistoga or St. Helena, and, you know, I'm trying to find a pair of shorts or something like that because it, it's so different. And all these things have such a profound impact over the characters and the qualities of, of a variety like Cabernet Sauvignon. And so I'm trying to capture these different areas and these different essences in Artemis. So for sure, we use fruit from our vineyards here in Stag's Leap, as I described. I mean, Stag's Leap District Cabernet to me has got this wonderful complexity, which I think is so important in wine. Um, but the wines, they tend to be complex, rich, but not heavy, not too over the top. So that provides a component, uh, but we also own, own a vineyard and source grapes from up in the northern part of the valley, you know, up in Calistoga and St. Helena, where, as you said, listen, it's warmer up there. Uh, so the fog, you know, burns off earlier, um, and you tend to get in those areas more black fruit, uh, more like blackberry, black cherry, and then this rich but soft uh, tannin structure. Um, we'll also source then or look for Cabernet Sauvignon on the other extreme then for this down in the cooler parts of the valley, like uh, our founder, Warren Vernarski, uh, still farms a vineyard for us down in Coombsville. So that's, you know, directly to the east of the city of Napa. And Cabernet there is very different. You know, this is a cooler region. It's got a real interesting soil down there. And it has more of like a, a tea leaf, um, like jasmine, and more red fruit, like cherries and berries. Um, and brighter acidity. Um, we have a longtime grower in the Wooden Valley, the Wilson family, and been growing grapes for us for over 46 years. And that vineyard for Cabernet also, it's a little more like it, it's got um, more uh, more red fruit, like red currant and boysenberry. But then we also um, look to fruit in mountain areas. The mountain areas are very different, as you said. You know, those are areas that tend to be above the fog. And so there's more sunlight up there but the temperatures don't get to be quite as hot. They're a little warmer at night and the soils tend to be uh, very volcanic. So we source uh, Cabernet for Artemis uh, up on Alps Peak. Um, and Cabernets from up there, they have a different character. They're, they're more like sage and huckleberry. You've talked about you sensing sense of earth uh, in the wines and the wines have a bigger, more broader uh, tan structure. So those are kind of the different areas and the different components, you know, I'm trying to make the best representation of a Napa Valley wine for the vintage. So Artemis is gonna kinda also take on some of the characters of the vintage. So you, you know, you put up, this is from 2017. You know, 2017 from a Cabernet standpoint, you know, we had a couple of pretty big heat spikes there in September. And so the fruit flavors in 17 are a little bit darker fruit. They're a little bit, a little bit riper and the tannin structures are a little bit more, a little bit more robust. I don't feel like the 17s are quite as powerful as say this 2013, uh, but probably at least for our wines in the past eight, 10 years, probably the second most uh, in terms of just tannin structure and power. And it is primarily Cabernet Sauvignon. I you know there's a little bit of Merlot in there um, that we'll use for softening, a little bit of Malbec uh, for spice, but Artemis is primarily Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, I keep it in barrels for about 18 months or so. Uh, in a combination, it's primarily French oak uh, with just a little bit of uh, American oak as well. And what percentage new for this one? Uh, it's about 45% new uh, overall. 
Gotcha. Wow. It really, it punches above its weight in terms of, uh, of, um, price point too. I mean, I think that's, that's what I love about the Artemis because, you know, everybody wants a crack at Stag's Leap Cabernet Sauvignon, but you're, you're, you're shelling out and it's a, it's a really nice, um, it's a nice, um, foot forward for Napa Valley Cabernet that is, you know, set relatively affordable. Um, and because uh, what you don't want to get to a point where with a Napa Valley Cabernet where you've lost the Napa Valley characteristic of it and it's just sort of kind of like Cabernet or maybe like red wine, the full bodied red wine. This really has Napa Valley Cabernet character, but it really has um, it offers a lot of value for the money. Um, Samantha's asking uh, cost per bottle and I cannot quote Canadian dollars um, and all that good stuff. But uh, here we go. OK. Um, so Heather McDougal says, excited the Artemis, uh, ha they have this wine uh, as vintage is essential at $90 Canadian, right? Um, or that's Quebec. Um, so that's pretty awesome because I know what that roughly translates to US dollars and you just don't find much Napa Valley Cabernet in that price point, um, you know, even here in the home front. So, um, so that's pretty darn cool. Um, so let's, um, I have one more question for you on, um, on extractions. We haven't talked about that yet, but, um, we've talked about, you know, tannin management when it comes to the post-fermentation maceration, but what are you doing? Cause you've got that, that beautiful staining and, and, de and density and richness that, that we would expect from these wines. What are you doing to pull that out? without um, you know, abusing the, the tannins and, and getting harshness and astringency in the wine. We don't have to contend with that so much because of the ripeness that we get, but how do you um, sort of pull the texture that you're looking for? Well, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's not really a recipe. <laughs> it's still what we do, and especially when you have these different vineyards, <laughs> really try to ta tailor the winemaking to what the vineyard is giving us. Uh, so I don't necessarily ferment Cabernet from Coombsville, let's say, the same way that I'm going to ferment Cabernet uh, up in St. Helena. But there are, I mean, a few general things. You know, I do like to cold soak up front, you know, where basically what that means is we crush the grapes and just kind of let it hang for five, six days before we actually will add, you know, add yeast and get things going. What that does for me, I'm not, I mean, we don't have issues getting color here in Napa Valley. But what that does do is that late in the fermentation, I don't have to chase it. So mm -hmm. if I do need to wind up going after color like we had talked about with the seeds and things like that. That's not something that I have to worry about. I've already checked that box and then I can go on from there. When it comes to pumping over or doing our rack and returns, um, the first couple of days, I kind of base it based on what I'm seeing in the field. And it's all about how much wine you're moving. So I kind of kind of figure out approximately how many gallons of wine I have in the tank. And in general, if I'm turning half the volume, that's like normal, right? If I'm going to go turn more than half the volume, I'm extracting. I want more. If I want less, then it's under half the volume. So in general, if it's like a normal vintage then, the first couple of days while the cap is, things are starting to ferment, I'll pump over, um, probably pump over uh, half the volume in a 24 hour uh, period. Um, and after that, I like to do the devil stage. Now that's rack and return. That's when uh, it's pretty labor intensive, but that's where you are draining the entire volume of wine out of the tank and putting it in another tank. And the actual extraction then is as the cap sinks to the bottom of the tank and hits the bottom of the tank, it like squishes on itself. And that's the extraction. So it's really soft, but you get really high quality tannin out of the wines. And then you gently flood, put the wine, flood it back over the tank, the top of the skins really fast. So it's not a fire hose type, but it's a flood so that it, the, the skins then just kind of percolate up back through the skin. So that we typically then will rack and return until I feel like I've got, I'm getting close to the structure that I want. Uh, and then I'll go back to doing pump, pump overs, but it, but the volume then usually is much less. I may only be splashing a little bit over the top of the tank until I feel like I've got that right balance between fruit and high quality tannin. That's again, the, it's not tannin, it's high quality tannin is what we're after. And at that point is when I'll, uh, I'll drain it off and uh, send the wine to uh, barrels for milk. Well, it's a, it's really, really beautiful. And, um, 
and uh, like I'm still like like going back and to, and still getting the, this like kind of coffee bean savory type of quality. Like it's it's not it's not jammy at all. It's definitely much more filigreed and um, on the savory side. So um, the um, Joshua Kelly is asking, would that process be extended in a cooler vintage, or would you be changing um, changing it up? I mean, again, I, I do like to leave the wines on the skins for a bit. And, um, you know, cooler vintages like 2018, I probably left the wines on the skins for longer. You know, again, that once I'm done doing the rack and return to Della Stage, you know, and again, I'm, I, you know, we don't, we, we show up early here <laughs> during harvest at like 5.30. And uh, I like to taste the wines that morning and then, uh, and then decide, do we keep going or do we drain it? And in vintages like 18, um, even 16, uh, those were years that I tended to leave the wines longer, you know, in that morning, like, I think we can go a little bit longer. I think we can go a little bit longer. Um, then, but it, but also is, has to do, I think, with the, not just whether it's hot or cold. Again, it's the uniformity of ripeness that I think is important. Because again, the longer you're on the skins, is when if the tannins are right, that skins and seeds, you can get some interesting complexity. But if there's something that's not not quite right right there, then yeah, you're going to make the wine more tannic, and it might not be the quality tannin that you want. So 17 is actually a good example of that, where again we had kind of a wild vintage, and uh, things were not it was not in the condition for me anyway that I felt like um, it was worth that risk to try to go for a super long. Uh, period period of time. Fascinating, yeah. So, um, all right. Well, that that's fantastic, and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for for this wine in the chat, which is is super fun. Um, let's move to the Saint Supery, and um, I think folks are tasting the yeah the 2017. Um, and I I think that you know I I always love. I always think I can identify that this sort of uh, there's a violet type of character on this on this wine and uh, and sometimes when I taste like the the straight the the vineyard designate Dollar Hyde Ranch I get that same thing, um, but um, Michael maybe you can talk to us about well yeah first of all tell us about the sourcing for what goes in here I think this is the first wine where we're talking about some elevation. Um, and um, although you had obviously you had some Atlas Peak fruit, Marcus, in the in the Artemis, but um, talk tell us about the sourcing and what that's kind of contributing to the the character here. Sure. Um, so at Saint Super, we, we are an estate brand, so we own all of our own vineyards. So when you buy a bottle of Saint Super every year, um, it comes from those one of those two properties or a combination thereof. And the, this wine's a combination thereof, but the, the vast majority of this blend does come from our Dollarhide Ranch, as Andrea has uh, mentioned. And it's, it's a pretty interesting property up on the, on the sort of the mid-northeast side of the valley. <clears throat> it's a um, really uh, impressive place, but it's quite a large property uh, for, for here in Napa Valley. It's, um, it's about a 1,500 acre ranch, but about one third of that is planted to vineyard. Uh, the core of that is Cabernet Sauvignon, of course. And, um, and it's quite a unique location. It's kind of like a valley within its, within a valley, uh, elevated to the point that <clears throat> it's, it's, um, has its lowest elevation is probably about 700 feet. Um, its highest end of elevation of Indians is about 1100 feet, maybe a little more. Um, and so the Cabernet Sauvignon is generally all on hillsides. So when I say that we're talking the elevations of about 850, and up to the 1100 feet. So we, we do have <clears throat> this elevated situation. So we are generally above the fog line. So we're getting uh, extended sunlight hours. And um, that has an impact along with the fact that uh, we have a, about seven different soil series on the property and, and a little about uh, like 16 different orders. So it's quite a diverse property from the point of view of soils uh, alone. And so within the property, when we, we're um, taking fruit from there, um, we're going to get different types of cabernets just on the one property because there's such diversity there in the soils. And of course, we talked about sort of Mid Valley in our Rutherford property earlier. Great location, uh, has a contribution to blend, but a little, a little less from a percentage perspective. Um, as we 
uh, look at the fruit from that uh, that property at Dollarhide, the lower reaches tending to make um, produce fruit that will give us a wine that's a little more gentle, a little more round, a little more supple, a little more elegant. As we go up on uh, up into the the higher ridges, we see a shallower soil, uh, smaller vines, smaller berries. So we're seeing a lot more density, uh, more structured wines um, as we go that way. So, uh, and all of these different parcels we have. And look, I've got, I mean, I think, I think we've got something like ninety different parcels on the property of, of reds alone. And so these parcels are generally being kept as separate entities uh, through the first mm, 15 months of the wine's life. Wow. And, uh, and that allows us, when we finally come to blending, to, to look at all of those qualities that each of those uh, sites presents <laughs> and, and put them together in a blend to create this harmonious sort of uh, subtle approach. And that's what we're looking for this wine, a wine that is serious and st well-structured, but yet some sort of a, somewhat more supple, more gentle, more charming in its overall feel uh, and, and approach. And so that's a, that's a lot of what we're uh, trying to achieve with, with this wine. And that's what these properties give us. And they're all um, sustainably farmed um, farms here, Andrea. So that's a lot of what we, get, we have going on there. The, there's this uh, real, there's this real black charcoal briquette, like spent campfire. Like there's a smoke, ashy smoke thing um, that's really, but it's just so subtle. Like I smell that. Yeah. Right when I get there, and then it, then it goes into the vanilla, and then it goes into the fruit. Yeah, and I, I think along with that is a little bit of forest flora in, in there as well. But I do agree that sort of dark fruit qualities, black plum qualities, uh, are very much contributing to this to what we have here uh, on, on the wine. Pretty interesting. What's um what's in the do you you're, are you blending in other grape varieties, and then what's the oak regimen? <clears throat> yeah, so um, we are this this uh, wine always is a, a blend of the generally it'll actually have all five of the Boro style varietals. Now, obviously it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, so it's core Cabernet. But, you know, in this case, we've got in the next varietal, is, uh, we have a little Malbec and, and the Malbec off of the Dollarhide Ranch brings some real vives to the wine. Even though after it's been in barrel for, for a year, a year and a half, it still has a real vibrance and life, life and youthful approach. Great color, of course, brings a little acidity with its life and what have you. So we, we add a little Malbec in there, not much. This one's got like 6%. Petite Verdo, we have some of that off of the same ranch. That one, that's very structured, of course. So it, it really builds uh, tannic feel, tannic structure, uh, depending on how much what we, we want to thread that in. Um, of course, the Merlot, a tiny bit of Merlot, not very much, but the Merlot is off of the Rutherford location. Uh, it grows, Merlot performs very well here for us. And it brings more, a little more centre and more roundness. Uh, and the Cabernet Franc is a, is a very tiny percentage, about like three percent, I think. And it's um, more structuring in its feel for us. I mean, Cabernet Franc can be different things in different locations, but for us, is a little more structuring. Um, so yeah, we have some a, a, a number of different uh, all those varietals in there, Andrea, and and they have a purpose. You know, each of those varietals have has a strength that can then that it can bring to the blend and enhance the overall uh, composition together. Yeah, so we do have that. As from an oak perspective, at St. Subri, you know, we're, we're very much a Bordeaux style house. So, um, we, and we're, so we're very focused on, on French oak and uh, we have a, a few different suppliers and, and suppliers that, that we've done a lot of work with that are, uh, from the point of view of doing our own um, custom toasting and all sorts of things, but we are a French orientated uh, outfit on this particular wine. About a third of the blend is in new barrels, um, and uh, you know, typically about a third is in two year old, maybe about a third in four year old barrels. Uh, older barrels still bring maturation, of course, but allowing the fruit to show forth, forth a little, help um, uh, enhance that sort of slight complexity of that subtle forest floor. Uh, uh, quality in the background with the older barrels. Uh, but the new oak brings more structure and some of those nice sort of uh, qualities that it can do. So yeah, that's sort of roughly our sort of oak regime that we have there, indeed. It's really, uh, it's it's very, um, uh, what I'm loving about all these wines in this, but this, the uh, term is coming to me as I'm tasting this. Um, and and uh, I think Marcus mentioned also the notion of um, like, uh, I think it was subtle power, but I couldn't be getting that wrong. But if, if we're four into it and we're building up this tannin on our palate, but I'm I'm getting this uh, experience of elegance, and um, and you know that's not a word that I would have expected to bring up, but it is very. It's like the 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 uh, 
the tannins are so fine and so integrated. And then it, there's like, everything is just, it's, it's coming out in, in subtle waves. Like, and, and I'm really, really appreciating that because I think there was a time when a lot of uh, master sommeliers got uh, very snooty about Napa Valley Cabernet because they got there. It, it was, it was not, the subtlety wasn't appreciated. And I think maybe there was a time where there was this big brawny uh, era, but in, and and like kind of an overripe era, we're just not seeing that here. We're getting such great acid, such great structure, such great subtlety in layers and waves and filigree and detail. And um, I mean, is that uh, is that like we learned a lot um, in our early, in our youth in our post prohibition youth, and then had the sort of opportunity to like really just like clear the decks and take it and, and charge ahead post phylloxera and the, you know, early nineties, mid nineties. I mean, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think there was an era uh, back in the, in the, like the nineties where we were looking at very plush, very ripe wines, ex excessively ripe, not bad, but just extreme ripeness. And they were really big, heady wines, jammy wines, somewhat, and what have you. Um, and, and so forth. And, you know, I, I think, a lot of us um, dabbled in that bandwagon for a while uh, and what have you. But I think with time, you adjust. And I think we've adjusted a little over time uh, ourselves. And you come and we haven't made dramatic changes or dramatic leaps to a different approach. It's been more subtle over an extended period of time. Yeah. But I think we do look for wines that have a little more vive, a little more life. And yes, we want our wines to be ripe. We look for ripeness and what have you. But that extreme ripeness, we're not necessarily looking for so much because, as I say, you bring that, you, you peel it back just a little, you can... Uh, allow the structure to be felt a touch more. You can allow some some real vive and freshness to the wine. Um, and uh, yet, if you work your macerations, as Marcus sort of pointed out, so described really well, all the maceration techniques, you work your macerations correctly um, and you utilise the different varietals we, like we have in this wine, you can create a wine that has impressive structure, yet sort of it's somewhat charming in its feel and what have you. And that's actually part of the goal of this one. And that's what we're doing with all that. But yes, ripeness, um, we have all of that. We all evolve over time. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and like it's a whole other topic on, on farming because I think people have so gotten so precision and so expert in farming almost to the vine. Um, right. that, that makes a, a, a huge difference, right? Because now we are able to uh, it, it's like the chef making a salad from, you know, nine different um, lettuces. Uh, you're able to really bring in just the nuances, which is super, super cool. Um, delicious wine. Lots of great comments on that as well. Um, and uh, but I'm just I'm generally like just loving the the, the whole array here, how we're, we're seeing diversity. But we're and we're seeing a lot of um, it's just subtlety and detail within the context of, of course, of our lush, powerful and, um, and uh, you know, big embrace, big bear hug of a, of a Napa Cabernet, because that's what we do. Um, let's, let's jump to um, the next wine. And I would like if, if my, uh, my great winemaking panelists can look at the Q&A. There's three that I'm leaving, I, we need to answer them. But if there's any one of those, because they're generalized questions, um, if there's any one of you who feels like you can attack any one of those, pop me a note in the chat so I can see, because otherwise I'm just going to pick on you and you're going to say, I don't know what they do in Bordeaux, if this is typical of Bordeaux, or I don't know about press fraction blends. Actually, you'll all know your own, so we'll talk about that. But my point is, check out the Q&A uh, if you get a chance. And in the meantime, we're going to jump to the, the Signorello Estate. Um, and uh, my quick story with this is I was working as the uh, beverage director at the Seagrill and Rockefeller Center, which is the restaurant right on the skating rink. And um, Ray Signorello came and brought his wines to me and we were the Seagrill. So we're focused on seafood. Yes, there was a steak on the menu because you had to have that. Uh, but uh, he came in and, and brought me their Pinot Noir. And, um, but, you know, very smart. He also brought the Cabernet and I tasted it and I loved it and I put it on the list anyway. So, um, but uh, anyway, Priyanka, you are the winemaker and um, we talked about sourcing today. And I think this is a really interesting thing because 
um, you're sort of right at that, uh, the, the, the um, I don't know, the, the, the collapse point where Pritchard Hill um, sort of stopped and <laughs> fell down and became part of Stag's Leap and, and that section of the Napa Valley that's, that doesn't have a specific AVA beyond Napa Valley to it. Um, and so these are some really uh, parts of your vineyards, or at least are some pretty intensely volcanic soils. And we, you know, talked about the diversity of Napa Valley soils, and that comes from our plate, our plate tectonics and the cataclysmic and seismic activity of, of faults and folding and, and plates crashing in, into one another and pushing this up and squishing that down. But we also had like tremendous amount of volcanic activity in the You'll, you'll tell me better than I know, but something in the 16 to 30 or 40 million years ago timeframe. Um, and so you get some of those really, really just hard rock, very, very poor soils in your area. Um, talk about talk about these vineyards. Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, so Signorello Estate, as I mentioned, is located on the more south southern corner of Napa Valley, uh, just further down from Stag's Leap. But one of the uh, things that Andrea and I discussed, and it kind of came, uh, we became more aware of it when I joined in 2019, because we had, you know, a lot of historical data. Stignorello has been a family owned, estate driven property since the 80s. Um, and 2017 was a defining year for us because of um, our loss due to the fires. But when we joined in 2019, it almost gave us like a fresh plate to start off, you know, a blank slate to say, oh my God, we have these old vineyards, all of our estate vineyards, the Cabernet Sauvignon, along with the Bordeaux varietals of Merlot, Malbec, and Cabernet Franc are all planted in 1990. Every vineyard block survived the fire. You know, we only lost five yeah. vines because a fence fell over those vines, but there really wasn't any heat related damage to the vineyards, which is, one of um, the key reasons Ray you know, continued and decided and said right away that we will rebuild and we will continue to do what we're doing. But right away when we joined in, one of our first things was, you know, let's find out more about the soil. And that kind of brings me back to Michael's point of, you know, when you're looking at this diversity in Napa that we're now starting to highlight, especially in the last decade or so, I yeah. think that has also come from you know, winemakers and teams really start to look and dive into the nuance of their site. You know, back in the day when we were, when this was a younger wine region, there was a lot of, you know, this is how it's done in Bordeaux, or this is how it's supposed to get done. And it was a more generic style in general, but over the years, it's become not just from a winemaking point of view, from a farming point of view, right. it becomes so nuanced. And so in our uh, approach to do that, we did a lot of soil pits and we found that um, were actually misrepresent, misrepresented on the Napa County Soil Series that defines us as Hambride Clay, uh, given our proximity to the Napa River, but we're separated by the river, by the Silverado Trail. And so as you move up our hillside and then further into that lower canyon, we increase significantly in terms of volcanic rock, in terms of sand content, and uh, more of a loam-based soil. And so Due to those features, I think we get a lot more power and concentration. You know, you talked about the soft power of Stag's Leap and that's something our back vineyards do really well. Um, we're farming the two sides very differently as well. On the front, we have Western exposure with North South oriented rows. So a lot of work goes into actually preserving the fruit. We're trying to keep that fruit shaded. We're trying to preserve all of the delicate nuances. And in the back, we're stripping the canopy out. We're opening it out to really get more exposure, more airflow, and more ripeness. And I think that the Signorello wine um, eventually reflects all of these different aspects of what is technically a single estate, but is farmed in two very different ways. And so we have the Cabernets, especially from the front side, that give us a lot of the power and intensity and um, more of like the, the balance in the wines. But then we have, and especially in the 17 that we're tasting today, this one's 88% Cabernet Sauvignon, 6% Merlot, 4% uh, Cab Franc, and 2% Malbec. And I think just that little step down between those three varietals really fills it up in these different pockets. So that Malbec gives it that more savory, herbal, mid palate length. The Cabernet Franc adds to the more delicate uh, violet and blackberry based aromas. 
but still has structure and power to it. Um, and with the Merlot, we just get a little bit more softness because tannin management is something that, you know, we pay a lot of attention. We have to with the smaller sized concentrated berries. It's very easy to go over the top. And so to keep us balanced and to keep the wine um, fresh and balanced is definitely always um, something that we're focusing our efforts on. You know, it's Nathan said um, uh, tar and violets and and uh, like it made me think you, you said only 4% Cabernet Franc, but when he wrote that and when I was smelling it and get, coming up with my own kind of for me, it's like like autumn leaf pile a little bit. Um, but uh, the, I think of Cabernet Franc as bringing that to the blend and it's a small percentage. But if it's a, but if it's a potent one in, in the sense of its uh, lifted expression. It can be giving like that extra level of detail that we're that we're catching here. Um, real real quick on the um, oak regimen for for us um, for this wine. So um, it's all 100% uh, French oak, and we work um, mainly with two different forests when it comes to sourcing this oak. So we're mainly um, sourcing from Troncé and Bertranche, which are two forests in um, France. Uh, we also pay a lot of attention on the seasoning, which is how long the staves have been seasoned before they get formed into the barrels and toasted. Uh, before the 2017, it was about 60% um, new French oak that was used overall when you account for all the different you know, blocks that went into, into the final blend. Awesome. It is just, uh, uh, it's, I, I hope everyone's still also going back and, and nosing the wines again and again and again. They're just, they could not be more different. And that's so cool uh, because uh, that means we're not going to be bored with uh, <laughs> with our our jobs in Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. But um, it's uh, it's really uh, I think it's I think you've talked about the precision farming. I think everybody on the panel has talked about really tailoring what they do. I think we did for a long time, you know, kind of just take our cues from Bordeaux and maybe a bit of a recipe. And now people are so dialed in to what to each plot and what it tastes like and it's so fascinating and um and i think we're we're just hitting our stride and we're already like you know so globally important in terms of a quality wine region and now now is when it's really uh gonna make you know it, it's a whole new level i mean it's like a step function to me um and i'm super excited about it um and uh and uh, you all as winemakers are too and that that's it's just, it's an infectious uh, enthusiasm and we all appreciate it. Um, we're gonna get to those last few questions. I'm gonna jump to the last wine here real quick because um, we don't have much time left and I'm sorry that I've run over a tad, um, but we've had some great conversation here. I will say that um, my personal story with Catherine Hall is um, very special to me. I, I, in 1997, competed in the Concours Mondial des Sommeliers which was the world championship that's hosted every three years. I was the American candidate. Um, and uh, it happened that year to be in Vienna, Austria. And it happened to be the case that Catherine Hall was the United States ambassador to Austria. And uh, she had grown up um, farming vineyards. Her dad grew grapes in Mendocino County when she was a kid, uh, wine grapes, and, um, uh, and had a passion for wine and wine farming. And so um, she found out that Vienna was the host, was hosting the Concours Mondial. And so she hosted all of the candidates at a dinner at the ambassador's residence in Vienna. And that's where we first met. Um, and then lo and behold, ever how many 20 something years later, because I was obviously 14 when I competed in that, just kidding. Um, but um, <laughs> I like to date myself. No, I don't. Uh, but um, we're now Napa Valley neighbors. And so her property uh, for, for Catherine Hall for this particular wine, they source from a variety of different partner vineyards, but the base of the blend is their estate vineyard up on um, the hillside in Rutherford called Sacroche. And so um, parts of it are above the fog line, um, but you're getting some obviously poor soils, low soil nutrients. And so you're getting small berries and, um, and concentrated and thick skins and the things you would expect from hillside fruit. Um, this is a, um, it's a one of the, it's, you know, her signature wine, she cracks me up when she says, well, I named it for, oh, myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's very, very cute. And anyway, um, this is a, uh, a, a beautiful example of, I think, um, how 
you get this sort of um, combination, I'm gonna say, of red and black fruit and that combination of sweetness from oak, but then also this sort of savory quality that almost smells like um, if you're long braising a short rib, you know, in your, in your oven or something like that, because it's very, very glycerin-y, a little bit of rosemary, a little bit of dark chocolate, a little bit of like roasted espresso or ground espresso. And then I think texturally, this is another expression also of Napa Valley Cabernet. I'm just going to taste it. And I think this is a great one to end up with because it, it is really a, um, it's powerful and intense, but it takes, it shows how you can do very, very dense extraction, very intense expression. Um, but it still comes together in this, it's, it's a, like, you know, an iron fist in a velvet glove in the sense that all around the edges are burnished and buffed out um, and velvety. And so um, it has, let me just get my fact sheet open here because I had it before and I want to give you the stats. Um, and now I'm not finding it. So I'll take a second and do that. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So 80% new French oak for 26 months. Um, and it is a blend of 90% Cabernet with 10% Merlot. And that's an interesting one to me. And I would, um, uh, because I, I feel that um, Napa Valley Cabernet, my two favorites are the extremes. 100% Cabernet, there are some of them that when they're 100% Cabernet, it just really works um, for me. And I'm not, this is not a right or wrong, this is just personal taste. And then on the other end, I really like when they have the, the filigreed notes where they've blended in, where as, as most of you have done, um, little bits and piece parts of the other varietals carefully selected both as to their expression and the site that, that delivers that. Um, and uh, because I always want that fragrant aromatics, I want that um, extra detail in the nose. But when you have like, Certain there are certain parts of Napa Valley where the Cabernet Sauvignon just gives that to you, and I think Rutherford is one of those. Um, and uh, <clears throat> people talk about Rutherford dust. I'm not sure what that means, but I know I like it. Um, and actually, Michael, you can probably tell us what you think Rutherford dust means, or you can say, "Yeah, we're we're into it," but or or we're in the in the neighborhood, but we don't get it. What do, what do you think about that? No, I think the, the whole term brother dust is quite interesting, actually. I mean, different people have different perspe perspectives of what it means. Um, for me, I think it's a textual thing. I think the the, the wines of, of Rutherford, and, and we we have four different varietals at Rutherford, which are all reds, but I, I, when I think about it, I think about Cabernet particularly. But mm -hmm. I think the wines of Rutherford are, have great texture, but they do have this feel, this tannic feel, but it's a very fine grain feel. So it's almost like <clears throat> a fine grain dusty feel. But all in a positive sense is really interesting. So yeah, I um, that's me. Other people tell me it's a an aromatic component. Other people mm -hmm. tell me it's a flavor component. For me, it's a textural thing. But yeah, I really a fine grain, elegant sort of textural thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I love yeah. that. And I think this was a, a good one to to end the tasting on because a couple of you, Max and Mega, um, and if I mispronounce your name, I apologize, but I think I'm close. Um, mentioning molasses and brown sugar. And that is often um, that and almost, especially the molasses piece because molasses is both sweet, but it also has that kind of tarry savoriness to it. Having grown up in the South where, you know, that's what you put on your biscuits, I know it well. Um, that is something that's to me, super common to, to certain styles of Napa Valley Cabernet. And I don't know if you were talking about the Signorello in that case or the Catherine Hall, excuse me. Um, yeah, the Catherine Hall, but I could see a little bit on either, um, you know, kind of like uh, minus the sulfury quality because like molasses has that too. And, and it's like the best of it. Um, the, the, um, as you go back and smell the wines again and again, they're really, really just continuing to evolve and express. Um, I want to get to our three questions if we can, cause we're five minutes over now. So I'm wondering if any of, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll ask all three of you, and, and for people who have to sign off, we have three more questions, and they are this. 
Will any of these wines today use press fraction in the blend to manage the finished wine? Finished wine as in color, tannin, and flavor, that's one. Another one is, are there certain type, sites and soil types or clones that always require longer macerations? Or is that variability in cuvées on time mainly driven by the vintage conditions? And then how would maceration times compare to Bordeaux? So we're gonna stay on and answer those questions. However, um, I did wanna say that for anyone who has to sign off and in respect of your time, um, that's the core uh, of the program here, but I don't wanna not get to those questions. And um, you guys have given amazing input. And so if you're going, thank you for that. And uh, if you're not, stick around and we'll do a couple more, um, we'll hit those. And last but not least, um, I forgot to mention that not only do I wanna see you when you get here, but um, I have a little, like we'll call it the shabby shack that uh, trade friends stay at. So if you need a, need a free place to stay, it's only for two people maximum and you have to wanna sleep in the same bed, but um, don't be shy, you're invited. Um, if it's open, you can stay. Um, so don't, don't come because you, you can't pay for our expensive hotels here. Um, so anyway, let's go back to our questions. Will any of these wines be using press fraction? Michael, you're on screen, at least for me right now. So do you use any press fraction in this wine? Um, we'll, we'll look at utilization of press fractions every year. And, and when we do press fractions, we don't do just a free run and a press. We do a free run and several different press fractions uh, and we maintain those separations. So we'll have a look at some of the light press fractions for textural fields sometimes, um, but we won't always use it. It'll be sort of seasonally dependent. Um, so probably less so, but on occasion. Okay. I'll jump cool. in and um, agree. I mean, that's kind of the same approach for us. There's definitely been some blocks. Uh, we do two separate press fractions, what we call the soft press and then the heavy press. Uh, and depending on the vintage, depending on the kind of fruit that it is, we might treat it differently. We might choose to use a different oak profile on it to see how that wine will develop. But the ultimate use uh, it kind of ends up becoming a separate lot of its own, as opposed to, you know, we have one wine and these are the three separate portions of it. Every, the free run versus the press fractions end up getting treated as three separate wines to make it the best possible wine at the end. And if they do develop, and in some cases they very much do, we, we will choose to use them in our final blend. And if they don't, then they'll find another home. <laughs> awesome, Marcus. Yeah, I mean, we keep our press fraction separate. And you know, sometimes those wines can surprise you. They certainly require a lot more effort. Um, they're always much bigger and much more rich, but as I've been saying, you know, again, it's about the quality of the tannin. Um, so we'll, you know, those wines require a lot more work, but sometimes, you know, um, particularly we have a basket press here uh, as one of our pressing options. And sometimes the press wine that comes out of those is pretty freaking good. Yeah, and has been in the right year, like be an interesting component. So something that we keep to the side to use it to add power as we need to. And those wines require a lot more work, but oftentimes wind up finding a home. That's super cool. Wow, Chris, uh, Michael. Oops, yeah, we, and we, we, in a similar fashion to what Mark said, we've actually got a basket press also. We have a number of uh, different types of presses, but the basket press is pretty interesting. And, and, it's, and I agree with Marcus that basket press can surprise. Um, and of course, we, we have a lot of very tiny fermenters here, so we can keep all of the, these little lots separate for, for uh, quite a while. And we do that, we assess it, and we consider it. Um, as I mentioned, it, it'll make a blend sometimes. Not... Probably not most of the time, but on occasion, yeah. Very cool. All right, so um, let's, um, I don't know about the question on how would maceration times compare to Bordeaux. I think that the, the, for the, the, this team of winemakers, they're very comparable to Bordeaux. I think the longer times, there are some Bordeaux houses that do that, but I don't think that's typical. Um, uh, does anybody have anything to add to that? I think we're, we're pretty comparable when we're talking about the, the seven to 21 day range, but do any of you winemakers want to weigh in on that? Um, we, um, within our group, we've got some uh, Bordeaux properties. And so, um, and, we, and I've been fortunate to tour a few of our properties, of course, in the past and, so, and some others. And there seems to be great variation, but I think from 
the experience of had or seen or heard this maceration time is a little not is less not more That's essentially not more. Mm. makes sense Le, probably less ripe tannins and and um, and maybe some other things to contend with on the incoming fruit um cool and then um are there any soil certain sites or soil types or clones that always require longer macerations or is that variability in cubas on time mainly driven by vintage conditions michael you're on screen for me if you want to start <laughs> Um, mm, interesting. Is the clones? I think it's sort of uh, season specific, site specific more than it is clonally specific. If you put me under pressure to name one, I mean, I'll probably, when I look at clone six, I, I have to consider it maybe a little more extension on that clone compared to, certainly compared to clone seven, for example. Um, or 337 in our situation. But again, I don't think it's clonally as much as, as significant as site significant as to um, maceration. And Marcus also put a, um, made the point earlier that it's all it's really about ripeness and evenness of ripeness, which let's face it, we're all trying to achieve even ripeness in our fields. That's why we touch our vines every year dozens of times um, to achieve even ripeness. We, we you know, we, we We'll take out leaves to get correct exposure. We drop clusters to have correct display, um, all to try to make an evenness of ripening so we have a great selection. And, um, and you know, with that in mind, season is going to have a big impact on it and site's going to have a big impact on, on, on extended maceration, what have you. I think more than clone, but yeah, there you go. All right, so um, I have to wrap up. So I'm not going to do the the um, that question with our other winemaking panelists, just because we want to make sure that nobody's missing all the meat. Um, but I know you can reach out to them if you want to get that answer from them. We have one more question. So you you're going to have to give me a like five word answer on the second part. The first part is if you only were given the choice, if you were given the choice of only using either mountain fruit or valley fruit to make Cabernet, which would you choose and why? So the why is the part where you have to give me the like one sentence answer. All right, go ahead, Michael, you're on screen for me, so. Interesting. If I had to choose one or the other, it'd be probably mountain fruit, mainly because um, it's just, in the mountains, we typically have more powerful, more structured wines. We typically grow plants that have that produce small berries, therefore have great density, a great opportunity to create and build a really serious red wine. That being said, I do appreciate gentle wines that have a, a personality of their own. But if I, if you give me a choice on one or the other, there we have it. <laughs> Laura says that's more than five words. She's giving you the hook. Um, I'm just kidding. No, good. Okay, Priyanka, Mountain or Valley? Um, I would say mountain, and it mainly comes from my prior experience. Um, I've, I was thinking about it right when you posed the question, and I've only worked with mountain fruit, so I think that's what I'm most familiar with. That's what I like. Um, the views are nice too, so that always helps. But uh, in general, there's you know a lot, a lot of power. It's a lot more work to get uniformity. It's a lot more work to really get balance. But at the end of it, it's a, it's a very rewarding experience. Uh, and so I would, I would definitely stick with mountain fruit and keep it going. Marcus? Well, for Artemis, listen, I see fruit from all over the valley, mountain areas, valley areas, north, south. But when I think of where does the most perfect grapes come from, it's freaking in Stag's Leap, which I guess would be considered a valley within a valley. So I got to go with valley. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm going to just, I'm going to close my part by saying that the Stag's Leap Cabernet that won uh, the Paris tasting was in its third leaf. So there's a bit of pedigree there. It does not take old vines to make great Cabernet in a great place like Napa Valley. So it does take great talent, great farming, uh, and great attention to detail and, um, and uh, a real passion. And we are so grateful to have that in all three of you. Uh, Michael, Marcus, and Priyanka. I am so honored to be your neighbors and your humble servant. And anytime I can do anything for you, I am here to do it because you make us proud. Thank you so much, Paula, back to you. Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrea, Michael, Priyanka, and Marcus for an amazing perspective today on Napa Valley Cabernet. We cannot 
wait to have you either back in Canada or us visiting you in Napa Valley. So we cannot wait for that. Come on, Jabs. Yes. So thanks to all of you today for joining us for the past month as we wrap up California Wine Month. We appreciate you spending your time with us. We look forward to the day when we can share our California wines with you all face to face. And we also want you to know that we're launching a state-of-the-art trade-focused educational platform called Capstone. That's going to be launching next month. So, so trust me, you will not be disappointed. It involves learning all about California via tastings, panel discussions, and online participation. So if you're interested, please register on our website, calwine.ca. We'll also provide the link for you here. Um, so please do register so we can fill you in on all of our plans for the next little while and for everyone uh that's joining us that hung on and for our wonderful andrea and our wonderful vintners we are going to wrap that up for the month of april so we're going to sign off shortly stay safe stay healthy and thank you all for supporting napa valley and california wines in canada so take care everyone and we will be in touch have a great afternoon thank you everyone thanks for being here